corn footprint calculator and corn conversion factors. Uh, we're going to be online for about 90 minutes. We've got a really exciting panel lined up for you. So thanks for joining today. My name's James Allen from OLAB. I'm today's moderator. Um, and I think what we want to do today is two things. So we want to present to you the footprint calculator for both soy and corn and explain how it works. And then we want to go a little bit behind the calculator to what are called the conversion factors to show to you how those conversion factors are calculated and how you can, I guess, trust the rigor that's behind the calculators that many of you are already using. Let me say just a few words about why uh, the footprint calculators are important. Um, I've been based out of Brazil for many years, and we all know that Brazil is a key producer of soy. Soy is the fourth uh, most significant crop in terms of the area of land that it covers in the world. Uh, I must admit, I had to look up, I guess, two out of the other three, but I had to look up the other three. So um, behind uh behind behind soy you've got corn wheat and rice which are the three crops that cover the largest land area so use up the most amount of land which is obviously a a, a, um, a piece of information that we're interested in when we think about those three so corn wheat and rice we can you know they're classified as cereals and the data that i looked at before we started today's webinar is that you've got about two and a half billion tons of cereals produced every year about half of that is destined for food use and about a third for animal feed. OK, so most of that is you know, the, the half of it, at least, is for is for human human food. Now, soy is very different. And I think many of you will know this. So soy covers the fourth largest area on Earth in terms of land use. Um, but most of it's used for feed, for livestock, for the meat and dairy industries. Right. Three quarters of soy is used for that. And most of the remainder is used for biofuels, uh, vegetable oils, or for industry. So we actually only, as consumers, we only eat 7% of the soy that's produced. Uh, that can be in tofu, in soy milk, in delicious endamami beans as well. But what that does mean is that as consumers or as, a, as you know, people concerned with the supply chain, we often don't know how much soy is embedded in those products. And it's often quite a um, quite a slow route or a long route to get from that soybean that's planted into our stomachs whether that's via you know a, a cow that's that's fed on that meat and then produces milk and then the milk obviously goes into a whole series of dairy products as well um, so what we're really interested in today is whether you're a retailer a farmer or even a consumer how do you make that calculation so you understand the footprint and the amount of soy or corn that is embedded in different products and what we're going to show today is RTRS has got a fantastic tool to enable you to do that. Um, the tool uses a mixture of tech, you know, technology, science, and we've got colleagues from uh, the consulting background from academia as well who are going to be able to, to talk us through how we do that. Uh, Marianne, if we could just go on to the next uh, couple of slides, please. So I think the first one is just a, a welcome from me, but the, the second one straight after that uh, is uh, is the objectives for today as well. Um, so that's me again. Hello, and straight into the next one, Mariana. Thank you. So, so this is what we want you to to learn about today, right? I think when we think about objectives, I think it's firstly it's kind of learning and doing. So we want we want to feel as though you go away from today, learning about these three things. We have a second objective, which is around you know RTRS has always played this role as a community builder around um, managers and, and actors working directly with sustainable supply chains, whether that's in soy or, or recently now in corn and other, other products as well. So what we're also trying to do a little bit today is create the sense of community around you know, a legitimate round table, which is that table in which everyone has an opportunity to express their voice and to co-construct a common future for, for more sustainable commodity supply chains as well. Uh, specifically about what we want to learn then, you'll see on your screens, we want to learn we want, we want you to, to go away feeling as though you've learned about the technology upgrades and usability enhancements for the RTRS soy and corn calculators. We want you to understand a little bit better um, what are called allocation methods for conversion factors. We'll explain to you what those mean shortly. And we want to, you to understand as well some of the conversion factors that are based on these allocations. So um, you, you can feel confident that we show how much of a given crop is needed um, uh, or, or is embedded in a specific product as well. Um, next slide, please, Mariana. 
Um, this is our agenda. Uh, we're using Central European time. I know many of you will be on different different time zones. Um, so uh, shortly, I'm going to hand over to Laura and I'll, I'll introduce her when I do so. We're going to throw out a, a quick quiz to you guys as well. Don't be alarmed. There's no right or wrong answers, but we want to get a sense of how much you know about this already. Uh, then we've got Will and Carolina who are going to be talking in, in much more detail around the footprint calculator and the conversion factor systems. In between those, um, those two pieces of, of presentations, we're actually going to demonstrate how the soy and coal footprint calculator works. We'll then have about 30 minutes at the end for a discussion amongst our panelists. And I'm going to call on Sean to join us for that from 3 Kill. Um, but we'd also invite you to add questions. So as you listen to Carolina, Will and Laura speaking, if you have specific questions you want to ask us, throw those into chat, we'll organize them when it comes to the Q&A and we'll try and answer them um, if we can towards the end of the webinar. Uh, and we aim to close, close at 5 p.m. Central European time. So that's our agenda for today. I think before we move on, some housekeeping points, Mariana, if you could click. Uh, I guess the, the key housekeeping is, is the usual. We've got interpretation available. So if you want to listen to this webinar in Portuguese or Spanish, you can click, we're going to be using English throughout in our panel, click on the interpretation uh, globe at the bottom right hand of your screen. I'm going to do that now. Yes, and I've just done that in Portuguese. So Portuguese is working great. Um, so you can listen to us in Portuguese or Spanish as well. We're using a webinar format today, so you don't need to worry about staying on, on mute. Um, but if you do want to interact with us, you'll see the, the, the questions um, sorry, the chat function in Zoom, and you can provide us with information there. If you're having specific technical issues, uh, Mariana, you'll see her here. She's labeled as RTRS as one of the participants, but you can also email her and she'll be keeping tabs on her email about any specific technical issues as well. Okay, so next, let me just introduce our three speakers and I'll, I'll introduce them in a little bit more detail when they come on board. So I'm delighted today, Laura Vijegas from the Roundtable for Responsible Soy Association is our first speaker. Laura is Communications Engagement Officer at RTRS. Will Schreiber is a partner at Three Kiel, a, an Oxford UK-based consultancy. And Carolina Beltramino is Research Analyst at the Agribusiness and Food Center of Austral University in Argentina. Uh, really delighted to have the three of you with us today. Uh, let me hand over straight over to you, Laura. Thanks for joining us. A real pleasure to have you with us. I know that you wanted to say a few words in your role as you know, working out of the Secretariat at RTRS in Buenos Aires obviously welcoming, but talking a little bit about the context of where the new corn conversion factors and calculator have come from, from an RTRS perspective. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, James, and, and thank you all, and welcome, everyone. It is uh, really my pleasure to, to be here with you uh, today. I'd like to briefly introduce and give a quick overview and background on the topic um, and then open to our expert colleagues, of course, um, who we thank again for being RTRS partners uh, and for materializing this ambitious project uh, we are uh, present today. So I will share this quick, if, if, we can if you can confirm, you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it well. Thanks, Laura, if you just want to put it on presentation mode. Okay. Yep, that's yeah. it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So. Just as a, to kick off and, and as a quick background on, on what we are going to, 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 to present today. As many of you might know, on, in October 2020, RTRS launched the soil conversion factor system and the soil footprint calculator. And this was a tool which we help, helped users to determine in a simple and practical way the amount of soy use as an input in the production of a specific soy products animal feed and food products. For this first step in the footprint calculations, RTRS partnered with Austral University, the specifically the Agribusiness and Food Center of the University that is based in Argentina, and uh, three kill in Oxford based as, as James mentioned before, both professional and reliable advisors in, in the matter. No? Also, we, we work along with the reference people, experts, uh, and the crushing industry and intermediate institutions. And this is how our journey started. But this journey continued. And in 2021, RTRS launched the RTRS, the Beyond 2020 RTRS strategy, that this is the, the RTRS Association roadmap for the period 2021-2026. 
And I'm mentioning this because the, 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 the topic we are sharing today is, in, is framing this in this strategy, you know? Among the many strategic lines of the five pillars on which the strategy is structured, today we will focus on two of these strategic uh, decisions. TNS decided to, on one hand, extend the knowledge and create synergies and opportunities to replicate soil certification to other oils, seeds, and grains and take a, and take a step beyond soil. And on the other hand, RTLS decided to keep, value, to keep adding value to the RTL certified material, specifically innovating and implementing what we call like a, an RTLS technology, technology package and upgrading current tools and developing new ones and, and the, the soy footprint calculator and now the corn footprint calculator is one of, of, of these examples. But today, of course, it's about, it's about corn and the corn conversion factor systems and, and corn uh, footprint calculator and, and why. And, and, and we are sharing some data on, on why corn, um, because on one hand, because of the rele relevance of corn in terms of global production. And because of this, we think that incorporating this relevant crop into responsible production circuits represents an opportunity to have sustainable supply chains in more comprehensive way. And on the other hand, because it make, makes so much sense in terms of synergies, no? In terms of synergies with the soil production standard, crop rotation is one of the most important sustainable practices to reduce environmental impact of, of crop production. And also corn is usually included in, in the rotation with soil. So this all makes sense because you might know as well that in December 2021, RTLS launched the standard for responsible soil product, the corn production that is available since 2021 to all RTLS certi certified producers who want to include corn production in the certification, only having to meet 14 criteria in addition to the RTLS soil production requirements. And now that this is in place, uh, and, and we are able to introduce the corn conversion factor systems and the new footprint calculator um, to, to estimate the equivalent volume of, of both in this case, no? uh, soy and corn. So again, we partner with the Australian and Thikil to come out with this first comprehensive source in the world of conversion factors now for corn. So this is as a just a frame and an overview of the, the, the history of, of, this, uh, of this tool. Um, and I would like now to turn the floor over to James, uh, who will give us more details on how will this meeting will proceed. Thank you, James. Thank you all. Great. Thanks, Laura. And maybe I can come back to you just in a second. I'm curious about those 14 criteria you mentioned. But um, just before I do that, uh, we wanted to put out a question three quick questions to all of you who are listening uh, we've got nearly 100 people uh, joining the webinar now um, and we just want to get a sense from you about how well you feel as though you how much you know about soy conversion corn conversion and the calculator right so you should see in your chat now a a link if you can just click on that link um, and answer those three questions it's how much do you know about it if you think there are any other products that could be added as well because we're just curious as to know the level of knowledge that's already in the room so we can pitch it to that um, another way that you can do that is just go to slido.com and uh, add the hashtag rtrs and there you'll be able to there you'll be able to um, answer the answer the, the questions and i'm just pulling that up now so that we can see it on the screen um, let me share my screen. So, Laura, just while we're waiting for people's answers to come in, um, you mentioned that, so for corn, what I understand is that people, let me see if I understood this correctly, people who want to certify for corn will use the standards and the principles that already exist for soy, and then there are ad an additional 14 criteria that relate specifically to corn. Did I understand that correctly? Exactly. It's, 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 it's as, it, as you said. The, the, the corn standard, we call it as an add-on standard. It is the, the, all the, the, the producers that are certified for soy, RTRS, that are um, RTRS 
uh, soy certified um, can uh, only certify uh, 14 additional indicators uh, and they can also certify the corn uh, they produce. As we mentioned, the, the corn is usually used as a, uh, to, to rotate the, the production. So it, it makes synergies, no? The, the, two, the two crops and the two standards. So with only 14 additional indicators, they can also certify the, 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 the corn they produce. And we already have some um, producers that are certified in Argentina uh, and Brazil the corn already. So we will have uh, good news soon for everyone. Fantastic. So thanks, Laura. That's a really exciting advance in the way that RTRS is operating. And people can ask us more about that as we go forward. But thank you for your time, Laura. Much appreciated. Let me um, then just bring up onto the screen the results of the questions that we've put to you. So thank you for answering those. We've already got 40 people who've answered that. So the first thing we asked you was, um, how well do you know the RTRS soy or corn calculators? We've got an average score of 2.2 uh, between 1.5. So the answer is um, not very well, and that's good because that's why you're here, and that's what we're here to explain to you. We've got about 8% of people who know it, 16% of people know it well or very well, 31% of people on average, and nearly half of people don't really know about it at all. So um, Will and Carolina, over to you. I think that, that says a little bit about our, our key public audience today. Um, how well do you understand the conversion factors? Again, similar sort of spread around 40%, not knowing much at all. Um, so more than half are below average here and about 25% know a little bit. Uh, and then finally, we asked you, um, which products would you like to see added to the calculator? Rapeseed, traceability of origin, um, lactose, soy protein concentrate, um, with sugar set sector, can you work with Bonsuka to get that certified? Interesting. Uh, emission factors per region. So here are some of the other kind of products that people would also like to be to include in perhaps a new iteration of the soy or the corn calculator as well. Okay, um, that's got us started and I hope that's got you interested in what's to come as well. So let me take this opportunity to handing straight over to Will Schreiber. Will is a partner at Three Kill, and Three Kill have played a very active role in developing um, the the conversion factors calculator that we're going to be hearing a little bit more about today. So, uh, a very warm welcome to you, Will, and I'll allow you to pop up here on screen if we can highlight Will, please, Mariana, and then share your screen as well. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I've just launched up my screen so that we can go through some of the background to the Archeris calculator and particularly the relaunch that we'll be. Um, talking you through today and giving you a demo of uh, later this afternoon. So the key question that RTRS had at the beginning and what we've been looking to, to answer over the past uh, few months, well, years, if we look at the first RTRS soy calculator as well, uh, which is this question, which is just how much soy and now corn are we actually responsible for as organizations or nations? Um, or theoretical applications within academic studies, um, but really trying to break through this um, uncertainty of how it is that you trace commodity flows through supply chains. So that quantification piece around how much of a commodity we're using is, is a core aspect of the calculator, as would be expected with any calculator. Um, and the key distinctions that we'll be going through today is, is really um, what happened in the past was we looked just at soy, but now at the introduction of the, soy, of the corn standard within our TRS, uh, this is being expanded further so that you can get both answers uh, at the same time. Now, within a calculator, there's there's lots of different ways that we can try to estimate the amount of material usage. And one theme that keeps coming up is uh, when you speak to somebody in a value chain, uh, they might say that everything that they're using for a particular material is the byproduct of something else that's driving more demand. So if you were in the livestock production sector, you might say, well, um, you know, pellets don't matter because we're using so much soy meal and high pro is therefore the big driver of soybean production. Um, and, and certainly with three quarters of the world's soy going to animal feed, that would be one consideration. However, we also know that oils are, would be a byproduct from that process. And from a value perspective, 
part of the most valuable part of the soybean is, is going into the oil sector at the moment. So looking at this balance of, of how it is that we ensure that buyers pay for what they use in a fair way um, reflects not that we're looking at byproducts, but rather co-products, because everything is going to have a value. The calculator itself is using something called conversion factors. And this is something that um, is used to summarize a bunch of activities into a single numeric value that can be used to estimate the content of, um, of soy and now in corn so that you've got a conversion per unit of output. So whether you're buying milk or cheese or a steak, um, there's a conversion factor within the R2S calculator to show you how much soy or corn was indirectly used in the production of that material. For livestock, it's, it's a fairly straightforward calculation just based on a number of different variables. But the key thing from the RTRS calculator is that you don't have to worry about collecting all of these points yourself. So we had to look at what the standard feed ration was, as well as the feed conversion ratio. So how much soy or corn was present in a kilo of feed, how much feed does an animal consume, and that would give you the soy meal or corn requirement. And then you can get this next step, which is the conversion to the soybean equivalent, so that you know how many soybeans would actually be, um, be required. And this is where the work with Australia University really comes into play. So in the first iteration of the calculator, Australia University did a study looking at all the different, um, different outputs um, of a soybean into um, various markets, looking at the processing stages that would be involved. So if we start with a soybean, a large part of it is going to be going into high pro soy meal in this case for, for high probe, um, but you're still going to be getting some, some pellets and you're still going to be getting some oils, um, which could then be sold as lecithin after further processing or as crude oil or biodiesel. Um, and with the soy calculator, it doesn't matter which of these materials you're buying, we can convert that back to the soybean equivalent. There's two ways that the calculator will show you an output, one of which is uh, a theoretical application based on just the demand for the material. So if you are that person buying lecithin, you might need a lot of soybeans in order to get a ton of lecithin. Um, and the demand allocation shows you that. So if you're an organization or a country that's wholly dependent on getting soy or lecithin, you might need a lot of soybeans and therefore have an interest in saying, well, how many soybeans do we actually depend upon? Whereas the economic model, um, which you'll see within the conversion factor is, is mostly useful for the private sector, which is where you're trying to determine um, the, the notional value, all things considered, based upon the value of outputs um, and co-products within all, all soybean production. So this example of an economic model for chicken just shows that if you have a ton of chicken, you're going to be having conversion factors for both the amount of soy oil that's produced, as well as the soybean equivalent, to get to a ton of what could be RTRS certified soy. This part of the presentation is a little bit technical, and I'm pleased to say there's a whole report called the technical report, where you can find out more information about the background and methods and the, the benefits and challenges of using each of these models. Um, how we decided which factors were going to be appropriate was conducting a review of, of available public sources. And then we selected the most appropriate studies to review the quality of to determine which ones would be the best to recommend to RTRS. Now, while there is a large amount of variability in livestock production systems um, and other commodity flows around the world, um, we've decided with RTRS to use a single factor to reduce any uncertainty. And if you have chicken, there's just one chicken factor. Whereas if you are in the private sector or you're a country and you have better visibility as to where um, your products are being produced, there might be more appropriate factors to be used in those situations. Um, but the purpose of the RTS calculator is about providing a really simple entry point for anybody who's trying to understand the raw material demands um, of their supply chain. Now, with an economic approach, which is what most private sector actors are using, it's dependent upon the value of those different co-products. And every year, RTRS updates those values, which means that you might see some variability, as we have done between 2020 and 2021, um, as we look at average prices over the year or just better knowledge uh, where it's possible so that we can um, adjust the way in which that demand is, is occurring. And this is for 2021. So keep in mind that this is before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has played a bit of havoc in the oils market, particularly 
um, and shot prices up. So those types of variations will be captured in the 2022 price update. Um, but as you can see here, even with biodiesel and oil, um, there was a bit of a jump last year, which means if you're looking at what's been the driver of new soybean production, just looking at that economic value of it, oils have had a, a pretty big um, incursion um, into the overall uh, demand side of things, which means that it looks like that you've got a higher soy footprint simply because that contribution and that pull for, for greater production uh, was a bit higher for oils uh, last year and will be higher again this year as, as well. So with that as the, the technical background, which is captured in the technical report, there's just the question of why is it that we have um, a refined calculator from one that was launched a couple of years ago. Uh, first of all, and most importantly, RTRS has come out with a new corn production standard that was launched in 2021, which then led to reasonable questions of, well, how do I know how much corn is perhaps present within my supply chain, direct or indirect? Um, and with that, it was again going back to that, that question of what you're going to be using that information for. And it could be that you just want to understand your commodity exposure, or it could be using for determining how you would like to support landowners that are in South America or elsewhere um, that are certified to RTRS. Um, and you're looking at buying credits to cover that type of demand as well. Again, this is one calculator for the world, but we're looking at different applications that could be used from the outputs. So just as we did last year uh, or two years ago, um, we reviewed the available studies with corn. There's a lot fewer studies, which is what's really unique about what RTRS has done here with Australia University is really looking to shed light on how corn is used within the food system and non-food system um, through, through, through various applications. So when we're looking at livestock production, it could be that the animals are eating whole corn. It could be about gluten. It could be about silage or bran or germ. All of these things are considered um, in the work of Austral University, which Carolina will be talking about in a moment. Um, and what we were doing with the calculator was being able to translate all of that um, to products, uh, whether they were livestock or, or other types of products, um, to make sure that it would be reflected in terms of what demand would be required. So this is a list of everything that, that's covered within the, um, the corn part of the calculator, where there's overlap with the soy calculator, you have both a soy and a corn footprint, but there's other things um, such as popcorn, uh, which wasn't covered in the soy calculator previously, but does have a corn footprint. And with that, we're, we're gonna be having a, a bit of a chat and, and walkthrough of the new calculator in a moment. Um, some of the key things that have changed is the visual design of it to account for that you have two different commodities and we'll walk through how it is that you can see the results for, for each of them. Um, but sticking with the simplicity of being able to enter um, the amount of material that you have, it just provides a bit more guidance to get you to that stage while still providing that ability to download the outputs or dig into greater details. So in addition to just adding corn, um, it was about more easily updating some of the back end things around commodity pricing for those annual updates. Um, and if there's going to be more products or co-products that you would like to have included, it's also very easy to insert those in the future too. Um, and through bulk updates, uh, you'll be able to see them uh, released more frequently than just on, on the basis that we have done between launch and, and now. Um, and the download of it output has taken account of your feedback over the past two years as well to make sure that it's really fit for purpose. So with that, um, thank you for listening to, to the main background and I'll hand over to James um, to take us to the next session. Thanks, Will. Do stay stay on here because I'd love to to catch up with you. I, and and fantastic to see all the work that's gone on behind the the calculator. I think what surprises me is how dynamic it is. Right, I didn't realize that the the conversion factors changed from one year to another in such a radical way. And obviously, in this next cycle, are gonna gonna change significantly again. I think what I saw there was that the the de gummed crude oil. Um, doubled in price per ton roughly between one year and the next so presumably we're going to see some pretty radical changes um, in the next version as well I, I don't know if you if you want to explore this now just briefly but I'm curious as to what that means for the people that are using the calculator if if the soy conversion factors are, are train, changing so radically is that is that useful for them or has that become a bit of a challenge do you get a, have you got a steer on that 
Um, well, most people will do their footprint once and that will give them a basis for comparison as well as a basis for action within their supply chain. Um, I think there's a big question as to how it is that people are using the RTRS calculator overall um, and, and how that fits with their broader approach to dealing with responsible commodity production and supply. So in some cases, what people might do within their organization is actually just lock it down to say, this is what we're using for right now as a baseline. And then from that point, it's about responsible sourcing. Um, I think that it's really important when we talk about kind of environmental action that unlike some other impacts like uh, climate change, uh, where your goal is to get to a zero footprint or a net zero footprint, responsible commodity production and supply is not about getting to zero. So if you get fluctuations within your soy footprint, that doesn't mean that your actions are going to be changing necessarily. What you're looking at um, is making sure that everything that you have, whether it's one ton of soy or 100 tons of corn, has been responsibly produced. Um, so whilst the numbers might change here and there, it's, it's what you do with them that's important and how that is, is reflected in your strategy. So many people who use the RTRS calculator, it's that first step out of the gates and trying to understand um, their exposure um, and the size of the prize in front of them, uh, rather than trying to be something that necessarily might flip on a on a daily basis. And, and even the calculator itself, the pricing will have lots of variability throughout the year. It's being updated once a year because you, you want to take that average um, for change rather than looking at all the variability that happen within a commodity system. Got you. That's a really interesting answer. And I think that answers one of the questions that have come up in chat. Someone's actually suggesting, you know, could it happen daily? And I think I think the point that you're making is it's not about constantly updating it it's about the principle of making change happen right so actually the numbers initially are very very important but but behind that is a is a policy or a strategy and it's about making that transformation of the supply chain so so thanks for for sharing that um well i think what would be really interesting is for people to see it in practice so maybe we can have a go at doing that what i wanted to suggest is maybe i can play the role of a of someone who might use the the the, the, the calculator um I'm currently in the UK, so perhaps I could I could be a director of sustainability of a medium-sized uh, UK supermarket. Uh, let's say I've made a commitment to zero deforestation in my supply chain, uh, and I'm trying to implement that now. And I guess one of the challenges I may have is that you know my suppliers are excellent and they've also committed, but they're not clear about the amount of soy um, being sourced because they supply many different customers, right? So the challenge I've got then is, to, well, how do I how do I try and quantify that from, from this perspective as a supermarket with a whole variety of, uh, of products? Perhaps you could um, bring on the screen the soy calculator itself. Um, and we'll, we'll flag corn perhaps at the end of this and I can ask you how it might be different, but just starting with soy, which is the one that many of us know quite well. So perhaps you could just talk me through what I would do in this case, um, Will, to, to kind of get a sense of how I could quantify uh, the amount of soy in my supply chain. Yeah, sure. It's always good to walk through these types of test cases to see what would be most useful. I, I think that, as you can see, when you come to the to the website now, it's it's very simple. It's quite clean in terms of the approach of looking down to find out some of that technical information that I referred to before, if you wanted more information. But the key thing is that as soon as you're down the page, you just want to calculate your footprint. So using the information that you know about your organization, by clicking that link, it'll take you down and just ask you a couple of questions before you can actually get started. One of which is just the terms and conditions of, of the tool, which uh, you should of course read before you click the little check the box to, to continue. Nobody would just tick the box without reading it, I know. Um, and, and the second bit. <laughs> would be just about capturing some information about who you are. Um, and there's no personal information that's collected from this, but it's just about helping RTRS understand what types of organizations. So in my case, um, or in your case, I would say that you're, you said you'd be a retailer, so you could select that you're a retailer, and you said that you're in the United Kingdom, so you can select those two ones just to get into the calculator. Um, this way, RTRS will know in the future just where the interest is in the calculator and when they look to expand upon it. If there's an area that's not using it too much, they can find out why people aren't using it. And if there's an area that's using it an awful lot, then they can go and find out what's being useful um, about it for others and if there's other areas of interest. Once you've clicked on that, you then get the choice of whether you'd like to look at both soy and corn or just one or the other. Naturally, today we're going to say, James, that for your example, we're going to look at both soy and corn to look at both elements of functionality. 
And when we click next, again, just part of that guiding practice of rather than just having a big list of things that you can select, um, it's going to be real specific. So in this case, um, I'm just going to be clicking on livestock products. Um, as a retailer, maybe we'll say that that's where there's lots of interest going from kind of soy as a background previously. Uh, and then we'll click next, and it's going to show us all the different types of livestock products that are available. And as we scan down, you don't now see all of the other inputs that you could have because of that selection. Um, but you can make it simple, make it larger. Um, and if we say now we're going to be just putting in our data, so what is it that you know about your organization? It could be that you have 50,000 tons of beef um, and maybe 100,000 tons of chicken. Having entered in our values and made sure that we've collect, selected the right weights, all we need to do is click calculate the results. Um, and the calculator will now provide us an output both for soy and for corn. So for those of you who have used the RTRS calculator before, you'll recognize it because it's it's aligned with the outputs and breaking down both that economic allocation, which is up here at the top, and how that's split between the different types of, um, of products that you have and a visual description of those, as well as the soy demand side of things down here. And just to reiterate that importance of the distinction between that economic allocation and demand allocation, you can see that the demand is much, much, much greater because we're looking at the theoretical needs of all of that soy and corn. And if you want to break it down even further down here, you can look at doing the detailed breakdown and you can download everything as a PDF um, so that you've got a copy of this uh, for the future. And then if we want to go back up to the top here, we can then select corn and see what the corn footprint is and how that's burdened down by the different types of co-products. Um, and here you can see a bit of a difference where poultry was the big driver for our soy footprint here. You can see that beef is actually the big driver of our corn footprint. So it's the same outputs, just structured in the same way without having to enter any additional information, but you're able to answer that key question that you raised, James. That's fantastic, uh, Will, and super clear. Just, just a little bit of clarity on the difference between the demand piece and the economic piece. So I'm a supermarket. I think you, you flagged at the beginning when you spoke that probably a retailer is more interested in the economic piece. Could you just walk me through slowly the different the differences that you sort of said there? You said the, the the demand piece is much higher. Is that because basically there's a lot more corn or soy in those products, but when it becomes an equivalent, which is the 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 economic piece, it's less. I just wanted to make sure I'd understood that correctly. Yeah, when you're looking at the economic allocation, you're looking at the full value of the corn crop or the soybean. Um, so that means that if you've got a high value material like soy oils or, or lecithin, it's gonna take a bigger share of saying, well, that's a, a big driver of, of producing that particular material. Whereas demand, it could be that lecithin is 0.6% of the actual soybean. In which case, if you wanna have a ton of soybeans, you're going to have to have 166 tons. Sorry, a ton of lecithin. You're going to need 166 oh, yeah. tons of, of soybeans. So the demand side of things is that physical requirement just to have what you need, whereas the economic allocation recognizes that there's lots of different co-products at play. It's a complex system, um, and therefore you're just getting a proportion of it that's based on the value of, of all of the products that come out of a single ton of soybeans. Fantastic. Thank you. Very clear uh, and very exciting to know that I can access something like that very easily. So um, do I need to be an RTRS member to be able to access this? Will, how does that work? Is it is it open to all users? It is. So just as you saw me click on that button earlier today, it's just clicking on, um, well, reading the terms and conditions and then just indicating where you fit in the world. Uh, but other than that, there's no registration required and you don't have to be an RTRS member in order to use it. Super, well, thanks so much, Will. Uh, and I know we're gonna call you back up on stage again with Sean, your colleague, uh, a little bit later on. Um, I'll hand over now immediately to Carolina Beltramino. If we could um, spotlight Carolina as well, please. So Carolina, very warm welcome. Delighted to have you with us. I know you're based in Argentina, so it's, it's still morning. You're probably on your morning coffee. Uh, Will and I are kind of afternoon tea here in the UK, um, but Carolina, thank you for joining. And, and I know that you've been working very much on the corn conversion factors, right? So that's some of the, 
the methodological calculations that have happened behind the calculator. Uh, and we'd love you to just talk us through, firstly, some of the processes that, that are behind the conversion factors, some of the products that are being, being used currently and in the future, and just show us a little bit more about the usefulness of the tool. Um, Carolina is research analyst at the Agribusiness and Food Center at Astral University, a partner to RTRS, and delighted to have you with us today, Carolina. So the floor is now yours. Thank you, James. I'm going to turn this video. Okay. Yeah, we see that very clearly. Go ahead, Carolina. Perfect. Okay, so uh, in the next slides, what I'm going to explain is um, what's behind the calculator, right? So first, I'm going to go through the scope and the methodology of the assessment. And the research is focused on the first in processing of corn. And our score is includes three industrialization processes, right? Well milling, dry milling, and ethanol production. Now, given the integrated nature of these industries, we included in our scope all the production processes and the resulting corn products that are typically integrated in wet milling, dry milling, and ethanol production plants. So overall, the result expanded and we addressed 32 different corn products and cook products resulting from the first processing of corn grain. Most of them you will be able to see them now in the screen. These products are then used as inputs in stages of secondary transformation in many industries, such as pharmaceutical, textiles, food and beverage, animal feed, among others. In fact, more than 1,000 different products are produced from these com products. So to address foreign conversion factors, uh, what we did was to develop a model on the volumes of corn products that can be obtained from processing a ton of corn. This means the yields of the industrial processing corn. Then the outputs of this model were used to calculate corn equivalent for each corn product. Now, the main objective is to provide a conversion factor for each corn product. Now, this conversion factor should be a general of general applicability. This means we need to obtain a single representative and reliable conversion factor for each corn product. But there is a diversity of technologies, processes, and industrial commercial profiles. And there are different types of corns and different product specifications that affect those conversion factors. So these cases, we focus on the most widespread industrial technologies and on most representative product specifications. Just let me give you an example. Dry milling and wet milling are the two primary methods to produce ethanol from corn. Now, um, ethanol production efficiency by dry or wet milling is different, and different dry products are obtained. There are different processes. So we needed to define a single conversion factor. In this case, we focus on dry green because it's the most widespread process to obtain ethanol from the corn worldwide. In fact, um, globally, most of the corn-based ethanol is produced in the dry milling plants. In the US, for instance, the largest producer of corn ethanol in the world, more of 90% of the ethanol process is um, in dry milling plants. Also, we need to look after the characteristics of the resulting products. Um, everyone here may be aware that there is a relation between product quality or purity and yields. So we need to obtain conversion factors for typical products that should meet standard specifications. For instance, in wet milling, the degree of conversion of starch that is expressed in terms of the Strauss equivalent and also the master contact of the product determine the yields of the conversion factor. Then we need to address these product specifications and what's more, focus on the most representative, most widespread product commercial format. And then this slide shows our method to obtain single representative and reliable foreign conversion factors. As you can see, the methodology includes collecting information from different sources and validating the results through triangulation. This involves comparing data discovered from the review of literature 
and interviews with technical experts and expert consultation and review. This is the way we identify typical and most representative processes and products for each industry, which are mostly standardized in the main producing countries. Each stage of the production process was analyzed and then single representative conversion factors for wet milling, dry milling and ethanol production were estimated. All the conversion factors included in the summary had been validated. But so how it is possible that more than 1,000 different fats are products produced from corn. So now I invite you to see the corn kernel as a container of valuable components and structures. Um, that will make it possible to use in multiple applications. Um, corn is basically starch, protein, oil, and fiber, all contained in three main structures that are on the right, pericarp, the endosperm, and the germ. Starch is the primary component and most of the starch is found in the endosperm. Corn starch has multiple uses, so that's why it's so versatile. In the, it is easily modified and it can make into sweeteners, such as uh, in wet milling processes, among other uses. Corn is also an excellent source of protein and fiber that are usually used as feed. The oil in may, is mainly found in the germ. Now, the germ is important in the corn processes for two main reasons. Uh, first, it is concentrated, it's a concentrated source of oil. And second, it absorbs more moisture, more moisture than other chemical components. So if it expands, facilitating the endosperm separation in the beginning processes. If we are looking in the, at the kernel stru structure, we can see that the endosperm includes two basic parts the hard endosperm, that is rich in protein, and the soft starch endosperm, that is rich in starch. Each endosperm proportion depends upon the genotype and the environmental conditions, and they determine the final use of the kernel. For instance, flint corn hard, has hard endosperm will be highly appreciated by dry milling facilities, that is to produce cornflakes, um, but in the other hand, then corn uh, is much used by ethanol dry green to produce alcohol, starches, and fructose. On the other hand, sweet corn, grown to consume the years, has a sugary in the sperm, uh, rich in sugars, and so that's the way, that's why we can eat it direct, directly. Now we can see here the images of the corns, the only two type of corns that are used in this industrialization processes that I will mention uh, uh, now are the flint corn and the dented corn. The flint corn specifically for the dry milling um, for food production and the dented corn for ethanol production and for wet milling. So these are the three processes that we analyzed. I'm going to go first with corn wet milling. Let me now show you briefly how we address the design of the corn conversion factor system. Uh, wet milling primary goal is to get the starch in the endosperm to further process it and use it as an ingredient in many different industries, including high fructose corn syrup, dextrins, maltose syrups. So uh, what mean allows a very clean separation of corn kernel components, which opens up the possibility of multiple applications, such as animal feed, pet food, sweeteners, industrial uses, food uses, pharmaceutical industry, bioproducts, or ethanol. The main characteristic of these processes is the separation of the key components of corns using a large volume of water. Corn wet milling includes two main stages. The first stage of the process is the extraction of the major component of corn. While starch is the main product, gluten feed is a fiber, and gluten meal, the proteins, are interesting byproducts because they are extensively used in animal feed. Germ is also important byproduct of the wet milling, um, but 
it is mainly used to produce corn oil, which requires a second germ processing. Corn germ is only processed in large volumes. So um, what usually happens is that wet milling plants deliver the dry germ to oil extraction plants that are big and centralized. In the second step, in the second step, in the second stage of the of the milling process, uh, starch is processed, and so the starch slurry goes to one of three basic finishing processes that will define the final product uh, that is in nitric starch, modified starch, and sweeteners. Now, worldwide, about 1,000 different products are produced from corn products from wet milling. That can be classified in food, feed, fuel, and industrial products. So these products include, for example, supermarket staples that are produced using both regular and specialty modified corn starch. Um, corn starch is also found in cosmetics and also in shampoo and conditioners um, and in paper products ions and printer inks. So corn products are commonly used in vitamins, flavorings, medicines. Um, also, most of the promising new markets for corn starch is a renewable replacement for petroleum feedstock. That is um, the production of industrial chemicals and plastics. That's an opportunity for this industry. Food markets use corn sweeteners for enhanced flavors, preserve and food and protect food, and maintain soft texture. Now, to get um, the conversion factors, the first step was to estimate the corn product yields. So these estimates that appear uh, in the slide are expressed in commercial basis. That means that they consider the typical product specifications and master of the main corn products and byproducts. The results are expressed as a percentage of the corn that was received in the plant. Um, the corn master that content uh, was estimated at 14.5%. So, and the losses of the whole process were 4.5% of the corn volume received in the wet mill facilities. What is interesting here is to show all the products that result from the integrated well milling processes. We can say here the process of all extraction and also the starch conversion. And there you will see that there are eight different um, sweeteners that derive from this process. Then we estimated how much corn is needed to obtain one ton of corn product or rye product. So for instance, um, if, we have, if we go here and uh, see how much corn is needed to produce one ton of high fructose um, of 42 dextrose, uh, you will find that we need 1.2 tons of corn. But if we look how much corn we need to produce one ton of corn oil, we can see that we will need 35.6 tons. Now we go quickly through dry milling. Now, um, dry milling primarily focuses on uh, producing endosperm grits, pieces of grits that are used in manufacturing breakfast cereals, energy bars, semolina or polenta or grits uh, for expanded snacks, breveries. Um, so corn dry milling based in semi-humid semi germ removal, uh, that is a process that is the most popular system worldwide and the type of industrial refining that was assessed. So corn is conditioned in water to hydrate the pericarp and the germ in the endosperm. After a series of milling steps, the three components are separated. We mean endosperm, pericarp, and the germ. This milling requires kernels with a very hard endosperm to get the proper size fractions required for the different uses. Very quickly, I will tell you that uh, this will lead to seven pro uh, products. Um, the main important one uh, from the economic perspective is the hominy grits or flaking grits. 
the um, then we have the semolinas that are endospheric fractions that are less uh, are smaller, and depending on the particular size of and the fat content, semolinas can be used for extruded snacks, polentas, um, or as a source of energy in brewery fermentation processes. And lastly, fine for a meal with smaller particle size and higher fat content is frequently used in pastries, in pasta factories, in sausages, and in meat emulsions as a starch substitute. Then we also have byproducts in this process. Um, and these byproducts are the germ, the core brand, that is the pericard, and small particle sized meals. These byproducts are usually mixed uh, in varied proportions to produce um, so technical flour, those also called hominy feed. This is used uh, for balanced food and animal feed. And it is similar to finely grinded corn and it has a good nutritional value. Now, uh, before finishing, let me briefly go through some considerations of our research. One moment. Um, the conversion factors here vary depending what is the core product. That means that if the industry focuses in producing hominy grids, we will see that uh, the yields of that product are bigger, and it, it may also have byproducts with less um, yields. So depending on the profile of the industry, that will be the yield. So we needed to make a decision here. What we decided here is that we would do the, um, the yield to estimate the conversion factors uh, that that were for the industry that uh, was producing those products as a main product. For instance, the yield of the hominy grids, if we go back, is the yield of the hominy grid of the uh, industry that uh, has hominy grids as a core product, the same as semolinas and intel polenta. So what resulted here is that, for instance, to get a ton of hominy grids, we would need 3.3 tons of corn. In the case of brewery wheat, we would need almost two tons of corn. And in the case of so technical flour, and that would be 2.7 tons of corn. Now, finally, we're going to corn-based ethanol production. So, um, as we said at the beginning, to get the more representative commercial factors, the following analysis focuses on traditional dry milling for ethanol production, not wet meal. Bioethanol production entails saccharification. So uh, there are specific enzymes that transform starch into simple sugars. Sugars are then fermented by yeasts and distilled to get ethanol. Dry milling requires kernels that are high in starch. So we can divide the process in two different stages, front end and back end. Front end operations processes are the operations before the distillations. And there we can get, sorry, and there we can get um, the, the carbon dioxide. And in the backend processes are the processes after distillation and they're associated with the recovery of ethanol and the byproducts. The main products resulting from these processes are eight. And they have variety of uses. For instance, carbon dioxide can be used in food industry. Then you have ethanol, hydroethanol, and anhydrosethanol can be used in fuel industrial uses. Uh, you have waste distiller solubles, animal feed, distiller dry grain, animal feed. And also, we added a process that uh, is called, um, it, it, it lets recover the corn distiller's oil. And you can use that to produce diadesal and animal feed. So 
What we can see here is that there are different lines of research and technological improvements that are helping to boost the economic results and increase the efficiency of right milling. That's why we needed to add the two last products. In this analysis, we considered a new and widely accepted technology, corn oil extraction, at the end of the process. As the ethanol industry continues to evolve, more varied, new, and improved and improved byproducts of dry milling will appear. What we can see here is that the yields of this industry are continually growing. So it is expected that this industry yields and the conversion factors that belong to this industry continues to change. Now, I'm going to show you the conversion factors discussed um, below um, and let you know that there are reference values in the driving industry worldwide, um, as well as uh, their industry averages, considering the use of different available technologies. Uh, since this, this is an industry that is evolving, uh, we were much worried and we focused to get um, validation of all of these uh, conversion factors. We consulted to experts to ensure the general reasonability of these results. So now as concluding remarks, what we can say is that this is the first tool that has this approach. The first to consider all these processes and put together the information easy. I mean, the processes, the corn products resulting from those processes, the yields, the losses, the conversion factors for all, uh, so it's a very useful field tool in this sense. Um, what I think it would be a good thing to do is a comparative study of the composition of the diets by value chain, characterizing the production systems by jurassic regressions, because this is something that changed and that we need to uh, think about it. Um, this will complement the information generated in this study with the work uh, of the soy footprint and have new product with greater applicability. So I hope, I hope Shane, uh, would you hear me? I hope it's a good. So do you have any question? Hey, Carolina, thanks so much. I can hear you, I heard you very well. It was very clear, so thank you. And we'll, we'll come back, I think, for questions. So, so stay here. Uh, and as you do so, perhaps we can invite Will and Sean to join us and we can explore um, questions amongst ourselves, but also some of the questions that are coming up in chat. So to the participants that, are, that have joined us today, if you have questions, they can be deeply technical <laughs> or they can be much broader and, and, and strategic as well. So feel free to, to put your, your questions to our, to our panelists here and, and delighted that they're joining us. Um, just before we do, I mean, Carolina, first to say thank you so much for that extensive presentation and all the detail that's gone into that. Um, certainly, what I take away from that is the extent of the rigor that's behind some of these calculations. So I think that that creates a sense of confidence in terms of people people wanting to use it and wanting to apply it for something that's so important as well. I'm also always amazed by all the different products that corn and soy suddenly appear in when, when you didn't expect them to. I mean, I, I guess three Kiel colleagues and Australian University colleagues are very familiar with that now. Um, those of us who are left, less familiar, it's always suddenly you see crayons up there and you think, well, how, how, did, how did corn end up in there? So, so really intriguing. And I guess, you know, supermarkets or other retailers that are using a, a wide variety of products uh, will have a lot of surprises when they start using these in these calculators. So thank you. Um, but, um, colleagues who are joining, do keep your questions coming. What I wanted to suggest for the four of us now, we've got about 20 minutes just to, to explore some of those questions and talk amongst ourselves. I think I think I wanted to start just by taking a step back. Um, I think those of us who work in sustainable land use are familiar with issues around soy. Again, I'm wearing a little bit of a sort of Latin America hat on here rather than say, I don't know, maybe, maybe if I'd been working in Africa, the, the, the corn perspective would be much more obvious. Um, but I'm just intrigued to start with uh, the question of, you know, why corn? So RTRS is, you know, its focus has always been a roundtable on, on, on responsible soy production and commercialization and consumption. Um, it's now gone into corn. So why is, you know, why is corn 
uh, the next kid on the block or the new kid on the block and the, the next priority. Perhaps, perhaps I can ask us to explore that a little bit first. And then once we've done that, I think we can talk a little bit about, okay, some of the products that we've heard, some of the next steps, and we'll start picking up on some of the questions that we've, that we've seen here. Um, suffice it to say, just to say thank you, Sean, for joining us. So Sean Allen is a senior consultant at 3Keel as well. Um, and delighted that you've joined, joined us. I know you've been actively involved in some of the work um, to develop the calculator and the conversion factor, so thank you. Um, so, so Will and Sean, perhaps we can just start with you. I know you've both been working with the, the corn piece. Um, and just what's your sense as to why, you know, corn is the next priority to work on uh, after soy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm happy to kick off. So thank you, James. Um, I suppose, yeah, Laura's kind of alluded to it already. Um, soy and corn kind of are typically grown together. There's lots of work already going on within the industry, but we're not kind of seeing the same sort of traction so far when it's coming to corn. And so we see this as kind of one of the kind of next commodities that's going to be on everybody's agenda. Um, and I think with that in mind, it's helpful to stay kind of ahead ahead of the curve, uh, ahead of the curve there. Will and Carolina, anything to add? Um, you know, wh why, why are people not yet talking about corn and why, why will they be? <laughs> well, actually, what was interesting when we performed this work is to see um, how the industrialization force what of corn was evolving and how um, with new technologies and new uses of corn and all this trend of bioeconomics, economics, uh, bio processes, corn is becoming more and more relevant. So I think it's a double opportunity, let's say, uh, from, one, from one side, okay, corn is becoming in the agenda, right? And it's, in, and it's having more specific uses. And from the other side, the, the opportunity to get better yields, new products, uh, new uses is also a reason to be to pay attention to corn. I think that is a is a good news. I, I think as um, just one, one other thought on it. So what's the drive here? And I think that there's one other grains, of course, are, are going into lots of different products and um, one reason I think corn hasn't been given that much attention so far is it's not generally been highlighted as the the big driver of some of the changes in production um, that we've seen with with things like soy. However, um, when you consider that a country like Brazil has three growing seasons and it's the same landowner, the same farm that's producing soy and producing corn and legumes, um, the benefits for responsible land management can extend to all three of them uh, because it's not like they're going to do one thing for just one crop and something else entirely for a different crop. So further incentivizing that same landowner for having an additional benefit for responsible production and, and stewardship. And I think that that's starting to be recognized is that it's, it's, it's multifaceted in, in terms of the commodity system and, and the ownership structures um, play a critical role in addressing um, lots of different challenges and whatever your entry point is, it's going to need to have the same result, which is um, better stewardship. Yeah, thanks, Will. So it, it sounds a little bit like corn has been flying under the radar and it's sort of slowly appearing here, particularly in the context of somewhere like Brazil, where you have those multiple crops. So, so interesting for us to, to take that away. Thank you. Um, Let's pick up on the question that we put to colleagues who joined at the beginning of the of the webinar around what other soy products they'd like to see. Um, so our question was really around soy products. So that means at the moment some of the soy products are dairy um, uh, and, and others that are there. So, so animal protein as well. Um, what else would it be useful to have in the calculator? Um, the question has been answered in a number of different ways, and I think that's interesting, right? So a number of people actually said, oh, we'd like to see other commodities in there. Just to recall what people put. So we had uh, actually in chat, so I know Juan, Juan Manuel Leiva said wheat. Uh, we've had beef and leather. We've had rapeseed, uh, sugarcane. Um, so, uh, and I guess this is more of a message to the secretariat. And, and I think Laura has answered that in chat, right? So the answer is, um, you know, doors are open. Um, but let's remember, you know, what are the kind of strategic priorities at the moment for RTRS? 
strategic priorities, obviously soy, now corn. Let's get that right. Uh, get the certification standards right for those, uh, the conversion factors right as well. So there's quite a lot of work that goes, goes around um, including a new commodity in any of these as well. I think it's, it's worth bearing in mind that the you know, addition of corn hasn't happened overnight. It's happened due to a lot of hard work by the Secretariat and, and partners uh, like Astral and, and 3 Kiel as well. Um, but, but duly noted, uh, wheat, beef, rapeseed, sugarcane are up there. Um, those who answered the question about other products, um, one person said, oh, we'd like to see it to include all soy and corn products. So that's the kind of first question, you know, is that possible um, to, to colleagues from 3 Kiel and Austral? Um, and then other suggestions were milk derivatives such as sodium cassinate. Someone will have to explain to me what that is. Um, soy protein concentrate, um, lactose drinks uh, and juices that actually, you know, in Brazil, for example, you see quite a lot of, of soy drinks or lactose drinks as well. So um, back to the three of you, please um, feel free to whoever feels ready to start, kick us off. Um, to what degree do you think it's possible to include, firstly, all soy and corn products, and then specifically some of these ones we heard, milk derivatives, soy protein concentrate, and lactose, lactose drinks? Absolutely happy to go ahead on that. I suppose what I'd say is when we talk about all soy and corn products, um, we don't want a calculator, you know, with hundreds and hundreds of products that you have to scroll through. Um, so very keen to prioritise um for the people on this call and kind of rtrs members and stakeholders more generally you know the the products that are most relevant to you i noticed somebody um put a call out for soy protein concentrate which i think is an excellent idea i'm aware soy protein concentrate is used especially in the fish industry within feed so i think that's definitely something we could add in in the future soy sauce as well i guess when we're thinking about kind of the feasibility of adding in these products if we're talking about the kind of base material of the soy and corn products rather than, you know, a livestock feed or livestock products, which use these in their production, um, we need to kind of be able to identify a price for that product. Um, so when it comes to soy protein concentrate, for example, we'd be kind of looking to see if we could identify the cost of that product. Um, as well as how many soybeans are needed to produce that product. So as long as the information is out there kind of within the public domain or uh, what Australia University are able to produce as well, then there, there is essentially no limit to what we can add in. Uh, I'm very keen to hear, to hear more from the stakeholders on what they would like to be included. Thank you, Sean. Carolina or Will, anything to add? Great. So what, um, what I think there is that it's true it, to make it complex, uh, it's not going to, to be uh, useful, but there are some things that maybe um, we could try to get a better approach, just as um, animal feed usage, you know, um, the, the Technology or the way of the production systems um, vary from regions uh, around the world. So I was wondering if, if that could be a way to, to make it better, right? To consider uh, how that changes um, in taking, considering the, the, ter the territorial um, past. Yeah, so let's pick up on that, Carolina, because that's uh, a point that's been raised in, in chat as well. Uh, Ramon Gerites uh, has asked a question, is in Brazil, beef can be produced with grass alone. How does the calculator take this into account? And Will, I think you touched upon this at the beginning, right? And there's always a challenge with something like this that, again, Sean has mentioned this, it's between having something that's sort of accessible and simple enough for people to use, but with the kind of uh, rigor of the calculation behind behind it so you know you know what we do know for example is that cows in different part of the world are fed on completely different um feeds um let's ask the question sort of where do we go from here you know in terms of improving you know continuous improvement of the calculator itself do we want to go to an ever ever more technical calculator where we do take uh, specific geographical conditions into account or is that almost against the principle of having something that is more, more around um, you know, getting people to sign up to understanding their supply chains uh, and transforming them? Um, 
big question. Uh, Will, I don't know if you want to start with that and then Sean and Carolina, if you have anything to, to pipe in with as well. Will, you're on mute. Yeah. So I, I think there's, ultimately this is an RTRS question, I, I would say rather than than one for us because we're, we're happy to use the best available information always depending on what the needs are. The, the background for, for the simplicity is that right now there isn't global knowledge um, uh, to all the variations that are applicable around the world. Um, and having a single value for all of a livestock product was considered desirable on the basis of if you look at something and say that it's only, um, you know, an Alaskan salmon and say, I don't have Alaskan salmon. So therefore the calculator is not appropriate for me. That's kind of not helpful where even though there might be some Uh, so I'm still here, and I think Sean and Carolina are still here. So we've lost Will. <laughs> oh, Will. Oh, sorry. I, I hope I'm back. Anyway, yeah. just just flagging that there's 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 variations, and we wouldn't want users to think that because their specific environment or their specific supply chain isn't represented in there, it's not relevant to them. Um, so ultimately, that's why it's not been that way so far. But you know, if there's interest and there's knowledge and there's um, data ultimately available, then there are, of course, always modifications that, that can be done. And it's the same with other products. Um, a lot of the limitations in terms of how many different products you can put on there is, is the limitation of how much do people actually say <laughs> is present within these different supply chains and these different product formulations. In America, if you pick up a can of Coca-Cola, it's going to be high fructose corn syrup. If you pick up a can of Coca-Cola in Mexico or Europe, it's going to be sugar. So these types of things are always going to be inherently uh, complicated, but the people who are using the calculator aren't necessarily going to know those complications in and of themselves. Um, and it's important to flag uh, the technical document where all these things are are, are captured. Um, but the nuance in terms of how broad it can go and how many things you can have in there, well, how long is a piece of string and how much evidence do we have that's uh, able to, to fit into it? Thanks, thanks, Will. Sean, Caroline, anything to add to that? Not particularly, no. I suppose I'd just kind of echo what Will said around it being a sort of balance between having a calculator that serves everybody's needs and provides useful information while still making it a calculator that's kind of accessible to everybody. We by no means want to make a calculator so complicated that it doesn't get used by anybody, but also yeah want to want to provide the information which is which is desired i suppose i'll also add that we've been very transparent within the technical document around um you know some of the gaps in information which exist or where a factor is specifically relevant to european production or american production we have we have included that um but on the whole global global averages are used so in reference to the question around brazil lean beef for example not requiring kind of soy or corn that's been factored into the global average um but of course you can't kind of currently specify that you're looking after it for a factor specifically on brazilian beef thank you sean um we're coming to the final 10 minutes so let's just pick up on a final question we've got here in the chat as well which again is probably more technical so that's from james mcculloch and thank you to others who've put questions or comments in the chat also some enthusiastic support to the to the calculator, so to the RTRS Secretariat, Australian University and Three Keel team. Fantastic job, says Michelle Norton. Um, James McCulloch says, for pork production, piglet and starter diets may contain up to 20% soybean meal, whilst finishing diets may only contain 5% soybean meal. Can or does the calculator take dietary and system of production variations into account when assessing the footprint of a pack of bacon on the retail shelf. Uh, who's going to answer that question? I'm probably best placed to, to answer that one. I won't go into a huge amount of detail, um, apart from to say that all of the sources that we've used for the conversion factors are included in the technical report. So you can have a closer look there um, to see exactly um, exactly how the conversion factors have taken account of those um, of those kind of values and variations within the diets and within the systems. Um, the other thing which I would say as well is, you know, um, 
the calculator exists really um, as an optional an optional means for calculating your footprint if you have better available information and you know you're you're a farmer for example and you do know exactly how much um soybean meal is kind of used in production then of course feel free to kind of use your own use your own calculations as well and if you wanted to convert that to see the demand or economic equivalent of the soybean meal quantity expressed as whole soybean equivalent then of course you can use the calculator to do that as well Superb. Thanks, Sean. Um, so those of you who are more technically minded, check out that technical report. A lot of the answers, I think, will be in that. Um, I guess just a final question then to our panelists. And thanks again for joining. I think let's start looking forwards from here. So, um, you know, you guys have been working on, on many of the technical aspects and the, the, the user interface as well. Uh, we've, had, we've had questions around sort of geographical scope. We've had questions about products. We've had questions around commodities as well. Um, give us a bit of an insight as to how you see the calculator evolving and the conversion factors evolving. Maybe it's methodological and we've touched upon those. Maybe, maybe it's more, more sort of around principles, um, but I would, would be curious about your insights as to how you see this, this, this in the next you know, 12 months and then maybe beyond that, maybe over the next three years or so. Um, Carolina, are you happy to start with that? Maybe we go Carolina, uh, Sean, Will? Sure. Um, what I think is that uh, there are some industrialization processes that are more standardized. So we don't expect a, a great evolution or a great thing, but for others, such as, uh, such as ethanol production, or maybe if there is a new technology that arises, just as I don't know, a new theme in what mean, there should be a change. So I, I don't think we should um, we should uh, try to to update it annually, but yes, for certain, uh, this needs to be reviewed. Um, I I wouldn't say uh, so frequently because of the of the technologies and of the maturity of the industries. Um, these industries are having here, I mean, wet milling and dry milling for centuries, so um, they won't change a lot. Not the yields, yes, maybe the economic valuation, um, yes, that that's for sure. Sean. Sure, um, thank you. I suppose a couple of things come to mind for me. Um, we've discussed kind of the frequency of price updates with RTRS. So I think as price fluctuations kind of continue, we'll be looking to um, update the values for soy and Sean, we've lost you. Will, are you still with us? Corn for Looks like you're back, Sean. If you want to go ahead, we you, we lost you for about 15, 20 seconds. Okay, maybe I'll start again then, because I think that was most of my response. Um, so I think one of the key thing is considering the importance of the values of soy and corn products, which feed into the conversion factors. We'll be looking to update those more regularly in the future. And we're discussing with the RTRS Secretariat how frequently that will be. Um, and also perhaps kind of adding in new factors based on based on requirements from the industry and maybe even taking away, you know, some of the factors within the calculator which aren't being used by others. So kind of continually assessing um, how we can ensure the calculator has the, the most useful, useful factors for everybody. And hopefully as well, I would like to see increased kind of availability of information publicly on the volume of soy and corn required for livestock production that we can use to feed into the calculator as well. So we'll be continually reviewing to try and try and improve the sources of data that we're using. Will. Yeah, I, I think that the, the there's gonna be lots of emerging needs, I think, especially when we look at um, how lots of companies take this this whole area a lot more seriously um, through due diligence requirements being um, implemented across Europe and the United Kingdom and potentially America um, in the coming months as well. And I think that many organizations are going to be using the calculator to understand the scale of their exposure 
um, where previously they may not have considered that they used any soy or, or corn within their supply chains. And now they're going to get questions from their customers um, to, to be able to disclose this, this bit. And, and the calculator is really the first step on that journey. And I think that because of that huge influx of knowledge that now needs to happen throughout the whole value chain, um, it's likely that there'll be further enhancements and requests that'll be needed to, to better reflect people's individual situations. Um, and as, as Sean has alluded to already, there's oh, the, the variances that are happening within supply chains are already captured within the tool, but there might be some desires for uh, an advanced user interface where, where people can start plugging in their own values um, into things as they get that information in as well. Will, Sean, Carolina, thank you so much. I'm going to come back to you in a couple of seconds and ask you for a, a sound bite. Uh, what, what's the one thing you'd like people to take away from today? So uh, bear in mind that I'm coming back to you for that, just a very short, short piece. Um, before I do that, um, we'd like to survey. We've, we've had nearly 100 people on, on the webinar today. There's always a really good turnout to these events. Uh, we really welcome your feedback to, to enable us to, to continue to construct them as we move forward. I've posted a link in um, chat, so click on that. It'll take less than three minutes to complete the survey, um, giving us some feedback about how this worked, what you're interested in learning about going forward as well. So please do that as well. Uh, and, and shortly, I'll take, say a little bit about the next steps as well, because RTRS is organizing a face-to-face -face meeting point um, next month as well. Okay, well, we'll do that now, and then I'll, then I'll ask for our colleagues to give us an insight. So can we have full screen, Mariana, and just on the next slide, please? So that's the survey. You can either click on the link in chat or go to slido.com uh, and use the handle RTRS, and the survey should be live. Shout out here in chat if there's any problems with that. Uh, just next then, please. So um, November the 22nd, so it's in under a month's time at Monheim and Reim in Germany. Um, that's that's near uh, Dusseldorf. Um, RTRS is organizing a whole day uh, meeting point. So many of you may have participated in previous conferences organized by RTRS. This is an opportunity for the those of us who are working with issues around land use linked to soy, uh, corn, and other commodities come together in person to discuss some of the most critical issues related to those supply chains. Um, we've got a really interesting set of panels in the morning around some of the new legislation that's come out of the European Union and the UK around responsible sourcing and its relationship with deforestation. In the afternoon, we're going to be looking at things around uh, regenerative agriculture, the future of agriculture. We've got a, a really exciting panel of speakers, um, uh, young people talking about how they perceive food uh, and land use uh, going forward as well. Um, so there's more information about that on the uh, RTRS site. Uh, and do come back and, um, uh, and let us know if you have any questions about that. Um, I see that our, our panelists have been taken off the spotlight, so I'm going to call it a close there and just say thank you so much to Sean, to, to, um, to Carolina and to Will. It's been fantastic to have your, um, your intellectual input into this process for us to get a sense of what's behind the calculator and the conversion factors. I think that's been really clearly explained, so thank you. Um, technical issues, do come back to us, reach out to us via email or directly through the secretariat as well. Um, do take some time to fill out that survey, and I guess just finally then to say a, a very warm thanks as well as to our speakers, to Mariana Aguiar and Laura Villegas from the secretariat and other colleagues from the secretariat who've helped to organize today's webinar. Um, Okay, colleagues are coming back. Let's, Carolina, let's take, can you give us a, a sound bite? What's your one key message you'd like people to take away today? And then we'll close. Well, I think um, this information uh, is very important because, because it led uh, people to understand uh, what is the, what we say, the, the corn, um, so the current input. So I think that, Having this tool that is so transparent, that is so clear, that is so easy to use, uh, is very important from this stage. Sean, and then Will. Sure. I think the main thing from my perspective is just um, interest in kind of how how everybody is using the calculator. Um, so just want to kind of reiterate the ask to to any users to feedback on how they're finding their experience with the calculator and what 
what can be done to improve the effectiveness of the calculator in the future, because we're always, and RTR is always willing to hear. Uh, I think that leaves me as the as the final one, which is is mainly, um, I always say, don't let a lack of knowledge of your supply chain stop you from taking action. And the calculator is really about providing that entry point to understanding an issue. So whatever information you have available, that's where you begin. And the calculator takes you that next step of being able to relate it to these um, uh, big complex commodity systems. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Carolina. Uh, I put the link for the survey into chat. Give us, give us two minutes to give us some feedback on that. Um, it's been a fantastic webinar today. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully many of you uh, in Germany on the 22nd of November for carrying on these kind of conversations, uh, rich and, and interesting conversations that we've had today. So see you next time. Thanks, everyone. And bye-bye. <laughs>